Mieko Kawakami is a skilled surgeon when it comes to words. She's able to dissect this world in a way that I think speaks to a lot of us as readers. In this novella, Heaven, we deal with the concepts and morality of bullying, with familial love, and even the concept of will to power, a 19th century German term from philosopher Nietzsche. But she breaks this down in a way that makes it very digestible for the reader. So the question is, why do I think you should read Heaven by Mieko Kawakami? This novel only came to us recently in the English translation, but has been available in Japan since 2009, where bullying is a big deal, and that is the central focus of our main narrator, who's not even given a name. He's 14 years old and is only referred to as eyes by his classmates. He suffers from strabismus, or sometimes in slang referred to as lazy eye, where the two eyes don't necessarily focus towards the same subject. It can look like one eye is off wandering someplace else. Now this story does take place in 1991, meaning it's pre the times of cyberbullying or a much expanded version of what we call bullying today. And he meets Kojima, Another girl who's referred to as hazmat for her smell and decisions not to shower, per se. And it's when these two become friends that we really start to explore their concepts of individuality, of isolation, how family plays effect with love, and even more. While Kawakami's style is approachable, lucid, and very aware of the emotional range that their characters have, the subject matter can be very difficult. Even for fictional characters, watching young children be bullied physically and emotionally can be difficult for many people to digest. And our narrator's situation is one much more deeper than just a medical condition. He experiences the world through his eyes, as do we all. But it's his eyesight that sets him as different from everyone else. The way that he talks about when he's looking at a girl, what's the best place to look? Because he's never sure where one of his eyes may be looking somewhere else and somewhere inappropriate. And since we are looking through the narrator's eyes through this, we have a very empathetic approach to what our main character goes through and how other kids will treat him physically and emotionally harming him. And we have to voyeuristically watch his friend Kojima also go through bullying, where it also gives us a voyeuristic look of we as a reader, we as an audience, where would we step in? Where would we see right or wrong in these situations? And how do we emotionally react to suffering and torture of other individuals? So what's with the title? Why call this book Heaven? And is this a religious book? Well, yes and no. The two main characters head to an art museum where Kojima promises to show our narrator heaven. And as a reader experiencing this through our narrator, we can't help but wonder what is this view of heaven and how does this make sense? It's during these scenes of dialogue where these two characters explore how they're being bullied and how do they justify taking this abuse, the suffering, what gives value to suffering? Because I think this is detrimental and essential to how some people interpret this world, particularly when going through bullying. To me, Kojima is the embodiment of compassion, talking about her suffering having meaning, which may even come from a religious standpoint when we think about heaven. And this is even overlaid with the Eastern view of things. Gold is a color that you'll see shows up a lot. And gold is a color that is used to be a color of the gods in Japan. A lot of the shrines are encased with a gold foil or even meant to represent mercy in some regards. And do these characters, does anybody deserve mercy for the suffering that they receive in this world? But that's where Kawakami really elevates this book because the opposing side, Momose, which if you look at the definitions of his name, Momo, meaning hundred, and Se, meaning rapids, current, torrent, shallows. The idea that this character, this bully is gonna send him through the rapids and the challenges of life is very symbolic of what he does. If you look at Kawakami's webpage, she admits that Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Dharathustra deeply influenced her in this work. And Momose comes to represent nihilism, the idea that there is no meaning, there is no design behind these things. Your suffering has no purpose and no value, so you shouldn't suffer it. It all comes down to Nietzsche's very abstract view, uh, one called the will to power, of what drives human beings to do the things that they do. And a lot of Nietzsche's writings has to deal with power, the, des the desire to have dominion or mastery over others. If you can do it, there, there's nothing that should stop you. You should be able to do what you want because there is no design or value in this world from a nihilistic point of view. And in some views, it is kind of an antithesis to religion. And this is what I think is the most compelling aspect to me as a reader and could be to you if you were to pick up this book. And I think that makes us ask, 
when we view our own suffering, do we put design behind it? Should we put design behind it? And where should we put mercy and compassion in our lives? Because I think if we can all find that reason to pull through suffering, I think that makes this life just a little bit easier to comprehend. So do I recommend this book? Silly question. Kawakami does no wrong. Her philosophical insights layered over very easy to digest words, but difficult subject matter bring this to a very emotional and evocative read for individuals. I highly recommend that you check this book out. What did you guys think of this book if you did read it? Did you pick up on some of the Nietzsche influences? Let me know in the comments down below what your thoughts were, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Hit that subscribe button to join us as we post videos every Monday and Thursday. Una out.